Rural Heritage on RFD TV is brought to you by Rural Heritage Magazine, a bi monthly magazine featuring articles about farming and logging with draft animal power, small scale diversified family farming and homesteading, and other aspects of our rich rural heritage. Rural Heritage Magazine, borrowing from yesterday to do the work of today. For subscription information, please call 319 362 3027 or order online at www.ruralheritage.com. Ralph Rice of Jefferson, Ohio is hard to describe with just one or two labels. He operates a successful small-scale diversified farm with draft horses providing much of the power. He raises beef cattle, chickens, hogs, and goats. He grows hay, spelts, and corn. He operates a well-equipped and productive sugar house to boil the maple sap he harvests on his own land with his horses. He manages his woods and fields with an eye for ecological balance. He slaughters and butchers his own meat, cuts his own lumber, and uses it to build his own buildings and splits his own firewood for fuel. Ralph works a day job off the farm, but it is clear the farm is where his heart lies. He can talk about the nuts and bolts of farming with easy authority and also wax poetic about his role as custodian of the land. We spent a day following Ralph around his farm and we'll be bringing you a number of episodes from that trip, each featuring a few of the many facets of his operation. Today, Ralph shows us his three percherin horses, the bobsled and logging arch he uses to collect firewood and logs, and the woodlands he is perpetually improving using those tools. Come here. Oh boy. <clears throat> I take just a few minutes time to brush them down. I do it already, but before I put the harness on, just to make sure their hair's laying in the right direction. And it's kind of like when you put your socks on and you have a knot right where your shoe goes. I like to try to minimize that if I can. So this is my tack room. And uh, I took the expense of putting these Rubbermaid cabinets in. Each one is, each horse has his own cabinets, sort of like lockers in gym class. Uh, it works pretty good. I was concerned that they may not let the harness dry, but it's been no issue at all. I uh, took boards put in here and then secured them through the cabinet into the wall. So I have plenty of strength here. They're not going to tip over. They don't blow over. They don't rust and they make a pretty good... It's worked out really good for us. Um, and it makes it look nice when people come through. I kind of like that. <laughs> When we moved here, I was only going to have a team of horses. And uh, so I put in two tie stalls and a box stall so I could switch them around however I wanted. Well, no sooner we got here and I wound up with three horses. And I guess I just stuck on three of them, don't want to get rid of the third one. So we make it work, and it works quite well for us. Harnessing horses is a lot like log carts. It's what you get used to. Some people will tell you you have to slide them up on slow and easy and well, I'm too short, so my horses, they learn to get their harness on that way. <clears throat> I'm not going to say the horses are too tall, I'm just going to say I'm too short. I choose to have bells on my horses. Guys in the woods used to tease me, what do you wear them for? I said, well, that way when they run off, I have an idea which direction they went. So far, that's only just a joke. <laughs> <clears throat> I bought these bioplastic harnesses, uh, let's see, 17 years ago. And they're just about like, like they were when we got them. They came from Yoder's Nylon Works in Charm, Ohio. And uh, I got nothing but good to say about them. After being a butcher for 20 years, my shoulders are shot. So the lighter harness 
works out really good. And yet, they're not so light that they're um, anything I worry about breaking or... And there's no nylon, so nothing exposed to eat into their skin. I like that part. Bad, but you're in the wrong spot, big fella. Back. Whoa. Whoa. Get over, Haas. Get over. Haas, get over. Come up here. Come up here. Whoa. Good boy. I choose to use this configuration. It's called bit to bit. Center horse has these uh, adjustable lengths of harness with snaps on each end that connects him to the outside horses. My regular lines or team lines just go to his um, bit on each side. So when I take him out and I want to just use two horses, the lines are already set up for two horses. It seems, at least for my three horses, that that's the perfect length for um, using them. The reason I choose this over a jockey stick, I think it's less um, interference in their mouth. It's a lot easier on their mouth. Jockey stick sometimes, it'll drag the horse where he wants to go and it kind of pounds him over to make it move. It's tough on him. I realize in certain applications that's a good deal, but these horses are fairly well broke. This makes a great hitch. I think it's comfortable for them. It's easy to drive for me. I use just snaffle bits on all of them. That's as much pressure as I need. Um, I suppose that makes a difference too. But um, I learned this from an Amish friend of mine and it's been a really good, uh, just a really good setup for us. Um, and I, to me it's all about comfort. I mean they have to do what I ask them to but I still want to be comfortable doing it. We get, you get this bond with a draft horse that they'll do anything to please you. They'll, they'll work for you because you ask them to, not because you told them to, not because they're afraid not to. But if we get on a heavy log and I ask them to come here, they'll drop right down and dig until I tell them to quit. I don't think they're doing that because they're afraid not to pull. They do it because a little fat guy asked them to. So. Ah, boys, careful. Gee a little, gee a little. Careful. Good horses. Good. 
this road to your right, we've used for 25 years gathering sap with horses. And that shows the impact of 25 years. That being said, road building is a constant, it's, it takes a lot of time and effort to drain the water and, and then get a little bit of sod to grow, <clears throat> which is all helpful. But the road behind us is a newer road and you can see, though it's coming along, it still has a ways to go. And we did introduce a wheeled tank this year. So I had three horses on a wheeled tank and the wheels make a little more impact than the sled runners do. But we have a disc all cut down to go on our trails and we pull a chunk of railroad rail to smooth them all out again before the next season. This is our firewood sled, <clears throat> a general purpose. Uh, local Amish men make some, uh, I had an ad a while ago in the Rural Heritage Forum, uh, mostly because he doesn't have, it's harder for them to reach out and so we had, we just became their contact information. They're very durable, you can see they have double soles so as the soles wear out you just replace that. This particular sled is six or seven years old uh, and we beat the dickens out of it and it just stands, it takes it. Um, as you can see, three horses on it. We can load all the wood you can get on, three guys, and the sled takes it and the horses take it. I mean, really, three horses is kind of overkill for what I'm doing, but the beauty of it is the third horse is getting worked with the rest of them. So if someone gets a sore leg or an off day, I can put another horse in and everybody's at the same level of fitness. And I like having them. No one's in the barn screaming and yelling because they're not out here, so it just works out well for us. Even though they pick on each other all the time just like brothers do. <laughs> so how do you, you load billets in here then? You, you're cutting the wood to... We usually line, throw or? it to, you know, sizes to go in either a fireplace or in the sugar house wood. Okay. Um, don't use it for logs. If we do, I take the top, this, these come out and I can roll the logs up on, but I generally use my log cart just because I have one and it's sure. easier. I'm standing inside the trunk of an ancient white oak tree. I've been cleaning up this firewood now for two years and I hope to finish it this year. I estimate this tree is probably close to 400 years old before it died. <clears throat> and it looks like that this may have been from a beaver chewing it Lord knows how long ago. It even saw the effects of fire at some point and uh, it's just an amazing tree. It was here probably when Columbus discovered America, if he indeed did discover it. It's a respectful thing, so I don't want this tree to rot. I think it's much better for me to be utilizing every bit of it through the sugar house, through the firewood, to heat homes and hearts. Um, I think it's a way to pay respect to an old one. So I've been working on this tree now. This will be my second year of uh, trying to get the firewood cleaned up. And it's incredible the amount that's here. Uh, we heated the sugar house, uh, did all the sap boiling, which is around 12 cords. Uh, we also did, I heated three other houses with this wood, and I barely scratched the surface. But about where my hand is, from this section down, this trunk is hollow, so I'll be able to cut through it and slab it off and work it up. This section here is going to require an incredible amount of work, so I hope to do it before it gets hot outside. I do my best work when it's cooler. <laughs> As you can see the sheer mass and volume of this tree, um, the limbs and logs up in here that were 30 feet up in the tree are the size of some trees <coughs> growing in the city streets. It just, it's almost sad how much is here and how much is left to go. Ha, careful. Whoop, 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 whoop. We manage our woodlot for, on a three-pronged approach. The first is for maple syrup production. Second is for wildlife because my boys and our family are hunters and enjoy even just bird song. And thirdly, for timber production. We don't have high dollar species of trees growing here, although we are slowly selecting for them and at some point it will, someone will re achieve a payday. I look at it this way, the woodlot gives us all the fuel for the sugar operation, the maple sap, and by just taking out the cull trees and the worst trees, we still get about a thousand dollars a year in payday or building material. Back, back, 
Back. Haul a little bit. Whoop. Back. Back. Careful. Back. Back. Whoa. Whoa. Put this in the log like that. Now, if that was a log that we were going to use for lumber, it would still be okay because that just grabs the slab. It doesn't destroy any wood. If, however, this was veneer, in that case, we would use the tongs so you don't mess up any of it, the way the veneer gets peeled. You want to keep the log centered on the cart. So what I'm going to do now is step the horses up and then back them up and take the slack out. Hey. Come here. Easy. Step up. Whoa. Back. 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 Whoa. Whoa. Now they know by the time they back up, it gets lighter each time. Yeah. So they usually kind of help you. If you notice with that shorter, when I start up again, it's going to raise the log up even more. And as we go up the hill a little bit, I'll stop one more time and get it nice and high. Come here, boys. Step up. Whoa. Back. Whoa. And that's pretty tight. And see how far we are up off the ground. So that works pretty well. <clears throat> and now we'll just head off to the landing because I can't really get a second log on too good without scuffing the wheels. And since it's just firewood, we're not going to worry. I always sit on my lines when I have them too long, which you got to have them long to reach in the back. It's just if you drop one, you haven't really dropped it. Come here, boys. Get up. Hoss. Mm. Whoop, whoop, jeep, jeep, careful, jeep, careful, careful, jeep, easy, I know, I know it's there too, back, whoop, whoop, jeep, I know, jeep, careful, jeep, careful, step up, whoop, whoop, back, ha, <clears throat> get over ha, boys. Ha a little bit. Get over ha. Ha. Get over ha. Get over. Whoop. Back. Back. Whoa. Ralph has been a frequent contributor to Rural Heritage Magazine. Last year he combined over 60 of his stories and essays into a book called Cultivating Memories. We're proud to include this book in our catalog. Watch for details on how to get our catalog or order this book at the end of the show. It's a book about farming, but it's more about farm life and, quite frankly, more about life. It's called Cultivating Memories, and that's kind of what it's about. Is We just had 50 homeschoolers here to tour my sugar shack. And that day, some of the kids ran and played and made new friends and were first exposed, it might have been their first exposure to a woodlands, I don't know that for sure, but I am very sure it's the first time they were in a sugar house. So I'm sure that somebody came away that day with a memory of the steam going out the roof and what that meant and how it tasted and how it smelled and I'm sure that those type of memories that I'm putting in other people's lives and making marks on their heart, that's what's in my book, those marks that are on mine. Ooh. Oh now. Whoop. 
Oh, boy. Uh, we get more and more exposure here every year of outside people coming in. It's by design. You know, I invite people and encourage people to come. Our customers, I much prefer that before someone buys a half a pig from me, they come and see how that pig grows up. They're born here. We have them from the womb to the tomb. And that kind of interaction makes memories for those people. They make a connection with food. They make a connection with me. And I don't think any of them will ever raise a pig, but they entrust that job to me. And what happens when my grandchildren or great-grandchildren, where are they going to learn that from if I don't tell what I know? It's, um, I think, around uh, 60 short stories. Um, there's 30 of them are illustrated by a lady named Beth Kasky who did a wonderful job. And uh, <clears throat> so you can pick the book up anywhere and read two or three pages and then put it down and open it a different place the next time and read. Or you can read it start to finish. Um, and it's a little bit of everything. There's humor. Sometimes I laugh at myself for silly things I've done. Uh, a lot of it are animal related because of anecdotes and things that have happened that involve the animals. Specifically draft horses, but there's cats and dog stories. There's, uh, I think it's enough to stir anybody's emotion. Um, quite frankly, my one daughter said that it should come with a box of Kleenex. She found an awful lot of things that touched her enough it made her cry. Other people uh, said that they laughed so hard they thought they were going to wet their pants. So it's, it's kind of a broad spectrum. It appeals to a lot of people. And it's wholesome. It's, it's, uh, you can have it on your kitchen table. You can have it on your dining uh, sofa table. Anybody can pick it up and read it. And, and there's no fear, no worry of, of anything bad. Whoa. Back. Whoa. Back. 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 Whoa. You step up. Yeah. Gotta break. Whoa. Never want to pull toward yourself. <clears throat> it's worse when you have tongs because they let them roll. It grabs not so much. <clears throat> Come here, boy. Ha. Come here. Careful. Yep. Hoss. Next week, Ralph gives us tours of his butcher and sausage shop and his large maple sugar house. He will also explain his farm management plan that incorporates his forage and grain crops, diversified livestock, paddock and pasture rotation, and woodland. This program is available for purchase. To order your copy, please call 319-362-3027 or visit www.ruralheritage.com. Rural Heritage is a bi-monthly magazine dedicated to draft animal farming and logging as well as other aspects of our rich rural heritage. It is published by Mishka Press, which also offers a complete line of back-to-the-land books, DVDs and calendars. Call or write for a catalog or subscription information. Or visit our website at www.ruralheritage.com. <laughs>